I'm going to open uh, with a spot of poetry, which is probably apt considering I'm from the School of English. <clears throat> In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. And I want to contrast that with something written 200 years later. It's scary to think that in some places it's 2014 and in others it's 2013, like some people are in the future and some are in the past. So my reasons for contrasting these two pieces of writing will become apparent as I speak to you this morning about creativity in the age of distraction. The first piece of writing um, is the opening lines from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem Kubla Khan, which he wrote in the late 18th century. It was published in the early 19th century. Now Coleridge subtitled this po um, poem A Fragment. Um, and in fact, the, the story about how he wrote this poem is one of our most famous stories about how the creative mind works in um, English literature. And in the um, introduction to uh, Kublai Khan, when it was finally published, he, he wrote a little bit about it, and I'm going to read that to you now. <clears throat> he refers to himself in the third person. It's strange, but go with me. In the summer of the year 1797, the author, then in ill health, had retired to a lonely farmhouse. In consequence of a slight indisposition, an anodyne had been prescribed. We know now that this was opium. Um, from the effects of which he fell asleep in his chair at the moment that he was reading. The author continued for about three hours in a profound sleep, at least of the external senses, during which time all the images rose up before him, and he composed two to three hundred lines without any sensation or consciousness of effort. On awakening, he appeared to himself to have a distinct recollection of the whole, and taking his pen, ink, and paper, he instantly and eagerly wrote down the lines that are here preserved. At this moment, he was unfortunately called out by a person on business from Porlock and detained by him above an hour, and on his return to his room, found that, with the exception of a few lines, all the rest had passed away like the images on the surface of a stream. Now, what we see here in this short uh, piece of writing is quite a few of the myths of creativity that continue to circulate today. There's the idea that we need to get away from it all and go to a lonely farmhouse. There's the idea that you need to be in some kind of altered state of consciousness to create. The idea that perhaps um, a, a physical indisposition underlines, underlies some kind of mental or creative vigor or clarity. The idea of inspiration flowing through us without us having any control over it. And of course, the last one, the idea that the mundane world will continue to intrude upon our creativity in this wonderful image of the gentleman from Porlock. I just think Porlock's such a fabulous, evocative word. We should turn it into a verb. To be Porlocked means to be interrupted, right, when you're doing something really exciting. Now, for a long time, I've been telling my students, because obviously I teach creative writing students, that all of this is a load of old rubbish and that, in fact, it will stop them being creative. If you think that you need to be in a lonely farmhouse to write, you're going to have difficulty writing in just ordinary circumstances. If you think that you need to be stoned to paint or you need to have inspiration flowing through you before um, you can compose a piece of music, you won't pick up your instrument and you won't pick up your paintbrush. You need to be able to, what I'm always saying is missing from this, take a teaspoon of cement and do the damn work. These are, these are ideas from the 19th century and, and we wouldn't follow ideas of surgery from the 19th century. Um, so why are we following these ideas about creativity? And in fact, let's look at him. I wouldn't even take fashion advice from this guy. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think, though, that I may have been throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think that there's actually quite a lot that we can get from Coleridge's, um, uh, Coleridge's introduction. I mean, if we put aside the white male privilege that he seems to be displaying, the idea of uninterrupted reflection is one that I think is really, really important for creativity, and it's one that's being undermined. So I need to put this up now because I need to do a disclaimer, and that is that I'm not having some kind of 
weird, strange, angry, knee-jerk reaction to the development of technology and all of the things that it gives us. You know, don't worry, ma'am, I'm from the internet. I'm okay and I'm on the side of social media. What I do need to do is talk to you about how the new paradigm in which creative artists work um, actually is starting to undermine good creative habits. So what do I mean by the new paradigm? Essentially, if you're an artist, a writer, or a musician, or whatever kind of creative artist you are, and you want an audience, and we all want an audience, you know, somebody said that doing a piece of creative work without an audience is like a kiss without a partner. Um, if we want an audience, we have to build a platform. And a platform is a, um, a recognisable public identity that can be leveraged to build markets and to increase sales. And more and more, because of the ease of technology, um, this platform is being created in the digital world. And it's fallen to the creative artists themselves to build their platform and to promote themselves in the digital world. So just to give you an idea, when I first started publishing books in 1997, I was pretty much the only writer I knew who even had a website. And what a website it was. It was a single page with a photograph of me, a dimly lit photograph of me that my brother-in-law had taken. Um, it had my name, it had a very brief biography. I hadn't done much in my life at that stage, so it was necessarily a brief biography. And um, I think the back cover blurb of the book, um, and I may or may not have used Comic Sans or some kind of other ugly font. I didn't know. It was the 90s. Um, so a website now isn't that kind of website. A website now is no longer a static showcase. It is a bustling town square. And what audiences expect is an unobstructed back and forth with the writer. The idea now is that we build audiences with our personal connections. Audiences want to be able to speak to us as much as they want to be spoken to. There's the idea that it's some kind of conversation that we're having with our audiences. And let me be really clear here, there's no opting out of this. The pressure is there. It's there from audiences who now expect this and so wonder why on earth you don't have a blog or a, a social media account that they can contact you on. It's expected, it comes from educators. If you go to a workshop, someone will eventually tell you, oh, you need to develop a platform. You need to sort of get your image out there and manage your image and, and make sure that there's a place where your audiences can contact you. Um, and you can bet, if you're lucky enough to be one of those people who enters the big bright world of publication and has their work distributed in some way, your publishers, the people who publish your work, will very much pressure you to develop a platform and maintain a platform. So, why is this a threat to creativity? Well, there are a number of reasons. Let's start with the most obvious. It is such a big use of your time. I don't want to say a waste of your time because I don't actually think it is a waste of time. But it takes a lot of time. Now, a couple of years ago, one of my books that I published under a pseudonym came out in the United States and I had no market there already. I had no audience there already. So I had to do a lot of this kind of audience building, this platform building in the United States. And what I did was I kept a folder of all the writing that I had to do um, to build that platform. So it was things like all the blogs that I had to write, the blog tours that I had to go on, long interviews that I had to type the answers into and send off to book websites and readers' websites and so on. Um, and I kept all of this in a folder and at the end of the process I added up how much I'd written and it was 12,000 words. And that is roughly a month's worth of work as a writer for me. So it took a whole month out of my fiction writing just to do this. And not only do you have to do all of this extra writing, but you can't write all the time about your book because that sounds like you're trying to sell people something. And the whole idea is you are just quietly trying to sell people something. But you've got to present this sort of authentic persona, this persona who is engaging with people on a personal level. And in fact, Ewan Morrison wrote an article in The Guardian, and he showed that artists need to spend 80% of their social media writing um, on topics unrelated to their work. And he very helpfully suggests the following three as being particularly good topics to blog about. Cats, food, and sports. I'm not particularly interested in sports or food, so I did actually even write a blog about my cats. <laughs> 
All right, so that's the time aspect of it. Number two, um, and there's probably some psychologists in the room who could speak about this more confidently, confidently than me, but it's an incredibly exposing and potentially self-distorting thing, this online self-branding. This is not being yourself, this is playing yourself. And that means that a good deal of your time is spent kind of outside yourself looking in, working, you know, looking at yourself and thinking, hey, am I being engaging enough in this one? Am I being approachable enough? Have I blogged enough? Do I need to tell people more about myself? Oh my God, did I overshare? What's going on here? Do I need to put more cats? I don't know. And while you're doing that, you know what you're not doing? You're not being inside yourself, nurturing your creativity from the inside, which is your core business. This is what you need to be doing as a creative artist. But perhaps the biggest threat arising from platform is the tools of platform themselves. And here I'm talking about social media. And we're encouraged to be on so many. Okay, so Twitter and Facebook are a given. You basically can't trade as an artist in this world if you don't have Twitter and Facebook. And then after that, depending on whatever your art form is, it might be Instagram, it might be Goodreads, it might be Pinterest. Um, I don't know all of them for all of the different art forms. But you're encouraged to be across so many of these and to continually keep them updated because if you don't update them, then the audience goes, well, that person has dropped off the face of my social media earth, so they must not exist anymore. And so um, what happens is that you're sort of caught up in this in this kind of vortex. And we all know, there must be, everyone in the room must know how addictive social media can be. I mean, it's been proven how addictive social media are. Now, you just imagine you've set aside Tuesday morning to finally master that track on your album that you've been recording. And you go, that's it, Tuesday morning I'm going to do it. And while you're making your coffee, you just get your phone and you just see what's happening on Twitter. And somebody said something outrageous that you could absolutely have to respond to. You can't let that go unresponded to. And so you tap out something and you send it. And then somebody else says something and you want to disagree with them or you want to agree with them. And then all of a sudden there's this conversation happening. It's what they call a, um, a Twitter storm. Um, and, and you're sucked into it because you need to keep going back and looking and seeing what's happening. There goes your morning. There goes the peace and reflection that you needed to do your creative um, thing in. It's not just the time you understand. It's the mental energy that is required to engage constantly in these kind of abstracted, shallow conversations uh, between people, some that, of whom you've never met, um, and the, often the sort of outrage and the feelings that um, come up when you're involved in some kind of social media um, storm. And what happens is we've all ended up with this weird twitch reflex and this, this verb, to check, has become the verb we seem to say most often, at least inside our heads, you know, check email, check Facebook, check the news, check that comments thread to see if anyone's liked it. Check, 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 check. We're, st we're just always doing it. And it's, it's very, it's like this weird mental short circuit that we have, this, where our energy is going into very strange and kind of futile places. So I want to talk briefly about um, social media and executive control, particularly um, how task switching um, affects executive control. So studies show that the time it takes to switch between tasks tends to be greater on average when participants switch from a task um, that is relatively familiar or switch to a task that is relatively unfamiliar. Now, the kind of output acceptable for social media is rooted in the familiar. It's your observations, it's your anecdotes, it's, you know, the picture of your breakfast. Why do people do that? I have never understood that. Um, it's the events that you're going to or you've been to, you've been to that you're talking about. Um, creative output, by its nature, is original and unfamiliar. And it's always an act of faith to create something out of nothing. And that gets more and more difficult the more time you spend in that familiar habit out of, habitat of social media. It's obviously much more easy to, you know, write an update status on, uh, status update, sorry, on Facebook than it is to go and, you know, write a poem. So what does this mean for the artist? And there have been a number of artists, I'm not just the only person talking about this, who have published articles recently about how they feel about the distractions of social media. Nicholas Carr writes of losing the capacity for concentration and contemplation, while Robert Hassan 
insists the internet's pace militates against a pause and reflection necessary for creativity. And Toby Litt mourns the greater acres of emptiness that he perceives creative artists of the past had at their disposal. These are all very, very um, affective reactions. There's this sense that um, here is a melancholy sense of loss of some kind of stillness or quietness that's gone. And I'm interested in this effective reaction and did a brief survey of around 300 writers to ask them how they felt about what social media um, was doing to their creative practice. Um, the pressure to maintain an online authorial presence was there. It's the only reason I started blogging, wrote one. I feel as if I let it slip, I'll be forgotten, said another. The cost of staying connected is definitely registered on the artist's core business. It can become so overwhelming, I get nothing done. 86% agree the internet distracts them from meeting their writing goals. I'm hopelessly addicted to the internet. I used to write a lot more before Facebook. Only five out of the nearly 300 respondents stated they never stopped writing to check on social media, while 55% said they did this often. I only write one day a week, but I resort to checking Twitter, Facebook, the news, when the words stop flowing. And other ones um, have this sense of deep self-blame about their inability to resist distraction. They call themselves weak. They call it, say they have to strengthen their discipline. They say they get so distracted. And there's this one, and it's, and it's shouted. There's this one that always gets me every time. I have to write away from the internet. It destroys me. Nobody's happy in these responses, are they? This is very strong language. We are being porlocked. And the worst thing about it is... We are doing it to ourselves. Sorry, sorry for patting my microphone in an inopportune moment. Sometimes when I'm writing, the next sentence isn't easy. It's hard. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know wh what I'm going to write next. And in that moment, I have a couple of choices. Sure, I can pop out to Facebook and I can write a little status update saying, I'm finding writing so hard today and within minutes I'll have lots of little likes and people sending me hugs and brackets and that kind of thing. <laughs> And I've got affirmation and distraction there. And I don't have to worry anymore that, you know, maybe I suck as a writer or whatever it was I was thinking. Or I can decide to reflect. I can be still and wait. And what I want to know is when it became so hard to be still and wait. Look at this guy. Be this guy. Look up. Because what happens when you look up is you see things and you feel things and you hear things. You see the way that the sun falls on the grass or the way that the leaves move in the breeze. You see, uh, you hear the call of birds or the distant sound of traffic. Um, and you experience this more embodied and enriched being in the world. And your mind has a chance just to be and to relax and to unfurl the answers to those problems that you've been seeking solutions to. And you can find joy in the moment instead of finding joy in the 25 retweets of your pithy observation about coffee from this morning. Make no mistake, the end of reflection is the end of art. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not a creative person, this doesn't apply to me. But it does. It's whatever your creative endeavour is. If it's a specific practice like music or art or writing, or if it's just the capacity for analysis and synthesis that you need for your university assignments, or if it's just the ability to solve problems in the workplace or in your daily life, you, need, you do need creativity. And that means you do need to make time for reflection. Seek the lonely farmhouse. And remember, just as... Um, the wizard said in The Wizard of Oz, or was it Glinda? I can't remember. Um, the lonely farmhouse has been in you all along. You just need to ensure that you spend a little bit more time there. Thank you very much.